Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Climate Change in Greenhouse Gases 101 for Sustainability and Operations. Uh, my name is Brendan Woodruff. I'm the co-chair of the Green New York Council's Operations and Engagement Subcommittee, and we focus on employee engagement around climate sustainability initiatives uh, and also finding ways that our agencies can operate in a more sustainable manner, uh, sharing best practices across the agencies, and creating a culture of sustainability within our operations. So I first off want to say thank you to everybody who's joined today. I hope that you, your families, and friends are all staying safe, are staying healthy. Uh, that's top of mind. Um, and I hope that everyone is doing as well as they can given the circumstances. Uh, we're probably all um, suffering from stir craze a little bit. Uh, I know I am. Um, I'm just here at lunch finishing the last fresh greens I have for the week until I can go shopping again. <laughs> um, but such is uh, everything that's going on now. So thank you again for joining. Um, today we've got a really great presentation. Uh, we've got Suzanne Hagel from DEC's Office of Climate Change. And she's going to go through, she's going to walk us through uh, the basics of climate science and how it's affecting New York and how it's affecting our operations. Two quick key housekeeping things while we're getting started here. First is everybody is on mute when you have joined. Um, if you have questions as we go along, please type them into the chat box. We are going to have time for questions at the end. So anything you can think of as we go along, just type it into that chat box and we're going to get to it at the end. Um, and the second is this webinar is being recorded. So if you have staff or others that weren't able to make it today, um, this will be posted on the Green New York website, which I will put a link to in the chat box and you can watch this or send this to others afterwards. We want this to be uh, a living training. We want this to be something that gets passed along to frontline staff throughout uh, agencies statewide. So please share it widely. So with that, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Suzanne Hagel from DEC's Office of Climate Change, uh, who does a lot of work in this area when it comes to inventorying emissions, uh, looking at different sources and what we can do uh, to lower those. So Suzanne, take it away. Thanks, Brendan. And uh, can people hear us now? It looks like there is a question uh, about not having audio. Uh, let me check. Yeah, so if you can hear us, please type it into the chat box. If you can hear us, please type it into the chat box. Yes, we do have confirmation. I'll work okay, with that great. person to see what we can do. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah. Thanks, Brendan. And I, um, I wanted to say too. So they, this is a slide presentation Brendan and I developed um, a little while ago with the idea that the slides could be given to anyone who wanted to share it and talk with their staff. And so, if you have feedback after the presentation on other information you think would be helpful that you may want to see in this slide deck, you know, please email me or Brendan, um, and then and we can work on that. Is that right, Brendan? Sorry, I put you on the spot and you probably muted yourself yes, and maybe eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just took me a second to unmute myself. Yes, that is correct. So any feedback okay. you have, if you want to take this and give it to your own staff and you want to make changes to it, let us know and, and we'll be happy to work with you on that. Yeah. Okay. So generally speaking, we're going to just cover um, where we are right now with kind of executive direction as well as the new climate law a little bit, a little bit about climate science, um, some impacts um, to New York at a really high level, um, and then talk, really get into how the, the kind of the way we look at greenhouse gas emissions in the Climate Act and in our existing kind of executive uh, goals how that relates to state operations, really just like really high level where the sources of greenhouse gas emissions in, in uh, organizations, um, just to get the conversation started and then point you towards some additional resources. So this is kind of changing moment by moment <laughs> lately. Uh, we had in the past a few executive orders, both from the current governor and previous governors, just in, around sustainability, but also periodically also mentioning things about greenhouse gases. And generally the goal is to lower uh, the footprint of our state operations and quote unquote lead by example for other organizations. Brendan and, and others have been working really hard to kind of consolidate various executive orders into the Green New York Initiative. 
um, and kind of improve and enhance maybe annual reporting on progress as well as kind of help agencies identify resources that they need in order to meet their sustainability and greenhouse gas reduction goal. Um, some of you may remember me also from EO 166 in the early days of trying to figure out how to um, use kind of guidance for how to measure emissions at an organizational scale and, and make those more user friendly for state uh, agencies. Now, this last year, uh, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act was passed and signed and went into effect on January 1st. It's a long act. It has a lot of deliverables for various agencies, primarily the DEC. But one of, the, one of the pieces that you may be interested in is called Section 7. And in Section 7, there's a point one, which uh, basically points to state agencies as implementing um, uh, programs to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So it kind of harkens back to the existing executive orders we already had, but now it is in the law. Interestingly enough, Section 7.2 also says that all agencies would make decisions that are aligned with reaching the greenhouse gas emission limits, which is what our goals are called now. Um, and I'm actively working right now on a rulemaking that would adopt those limits. Um, and I can give you more feedback offline if you have any questions about that, uh, but it, it kind of relates to this as well. And I think as you see future uh, stuff come out of the Green New York Initiative direction, resources is going to be geared towards also helping agencies comply with this Section 7.1. Um, just to step back a little bit, just to remind us of why we have a law now uh, putting a lot more enforcement down on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this is a, an image from the U.S. Climate, uh, sorry, the U.S. National Climate Assessment. So uh, there's a federal law that says that it, periodically that um, this office out of NOAA will, will establish like a, a, an assessment of how climate change is affecting the United States. And there was a recent update to that last year, and I recommend you look at it if you want to kind of see the state of the science. And I think it's a pretty interesting report. And one of the questions that we get a lot, just generally from the public, is how do we know that it's greenhouse gases and our own actions that are driving climate change versus maybe natural forces like volcanoes uh, for example, that may be driving um, the, what we're experiencing. So this is just a chart from that last National Climate Assessment. It has uh, the black line is the temperature change that we've observed over time, basically from average temperatures. Um, and you can see how that line tracks kind of like this blue trend versus the green trend, the blue trend being if you check natural factors and the impacts expected from greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously that more closely tracks what we've observed as far as temperature change from an average. And the problem is, is that this is a trend that will continue and we need to figure out what's driving climate change and we know it's greenhouse gases and then try to and put policy into place to bring um, that trend back down. And the problem is that the longer we've been, this is that a narrative that's been told for about 30 years now, which is the longer we wait, the bigger of a, of, and quicker of a transition we need to make away from the sources of greenhouse gas emissions or fossil fuels. And then the longer you wait, the more expensive it gets. So it's a bigger transition, it's a more expensive transition the longer we delay. So it's really in our interest, particularly as public agencies, to uh, make it change sooner rather than later. And if we continue under kind of a business as usual, we continue to grow our economies using the technologies we, we've been using, then we're going to get to, you know, a point where we've, we've overshot our ability to really bring emissions down. Um, and this is, I'm bringing a slide from, <laughs> from my colleague, Mark Lowry. It gives a lot of great presentations and we have a lot of them recorded if you're interested on kind of the impacts to New York State. Um, and there's a great uh, report. We also periodically update uh, with our partners at NYSERDA called the Climate Report, which is a report specifically on impacts to New York State. Um, obviously, just globally, the trends are higher, average emissions, more precipitation, um, while also having more frequent droughts, basically the timing and and amount of rainfall that you might experience. 
Sea level rise, obviously a big concern for New York State. We also have a regulation that adopted projections for sea level rise that I know a lot of people are trying to incorporate into how they plan for new construction. Um, a lot more just extreme events. In the short term, that includes extreme snow events, uh, which you may not expect, but that's what happens when you increase precipitation ex extremes, uh, as well as having kind of warmer lake water in the, in the cold winter. Um, the outcomes of these things increases the likelihood and, and at rate at which we're experiencing new diseases and new pests. What I think is interesting, working with colleagues in the Division of Lands and Forests, is also thinking about maybe the biggest threat in terms of disease and pests that we have to think about isn't things coming, aren't uh, species coming from outside our borders, but maybe diseases and pests that already exist within our borders but weren't as severe of, a, of an issue in the past. Um, lots of risks to people. Uh, homes and, uh, and communities, stressing our infrastructure, and of course, agricultural and ecosystem effects, which we work with a lot of different parties through a lot of our sister agencies to address. So what are the main sources? Now, the rest of the presentation today is going to be about those greenhouse gas sources and what we understand about them and you know, how they may relate to operations. Now, this is an image that we actually created um, with our last greenhouse gas inventory that we worked on with NYSERDA, and that's on the NYSERDA website. And we made this image to put on magnets. We have a lot of these magnets if people are interested. And based on the way that we have been estimating emissions, which is consistent with the way the U.S. EPA measures national emissions, and the U.S. EPA measures that it's based on protocols provided by the U.N., so all countries use the same methods. This is the way that you could look at emissions that we have now in New York State. So mostly transportation, but a pretty equal amount with what we would call buildings. They're basically the use of fuels within homes and maybe commercial operations and industry. So, for example, if you heat or cool with natural gas, uh, that's where this this bucket uh, is, and then electricity generation is maybe half of that. But the important thing about electricity generation is we have a really clean grid, particularly in upstate New York. But one of the solutions, or the big solution for transportation emissions and building emissions is to electrify things. So we really want to continue to clean up electricity because electricity is going to be the fuel for the future for transportation and building. There are a couple other sources to note. Uh, food waste, so waste going into landfills and generating methane, as well as some uh, wastewater treatment and waste combustion emissions. Um, refrigerants alone, we're going to talk about refrigerants, they're the largest source impacted almost the, all of the emissions from industry within New York State because they're such a big, they have such a big impact on climate change. And then agriculture. Now, the thing I have to, I have to give you a caveat about this is the the new climate legislation in New York State would have us measure emissions differently, and that's the rulemaking I'm working on now. The large source of emissions won't change, but there's an emphasis placed on other, on gases that aren't CO2, and so you're going to see some of these, some of these sectors actually increase a lot, not because the emissions have increased, but because the way we calculate emissions will change. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a couple of slides. Okay, so there are six greenhouse gases, and they're called the Kyoto gases because there was an international agreement made in Kyoto uh, in the 90s about um, how countries like the U.S. should be measuring their greenhouse gases. And they selected the six greenhouse gases that have the biggest impact on climate change. Um, and there's a seventh one that's now been added, um, but we don't need to get into it today. Uh, three of them are naturally occurring, and then three of them um, although all of these gases are, are increasing in concentration in the atmosphere due to the human impact, uh, some of these gases, so these, the last three, are actually synthetic gases that we actually created uh, for industrial purposes. So the three naturally occurring ones, you've heard of these before, I'm sure, carbon dioxide, and we hear about CO2 all the time when talking about climate change. In fact, the shorthand for almost all of these gases is people call it carbon or carbon emissions or carbon pollution, even though not all of these gases have carbon in them. 
Uh, carbon dioxide is such a big piece that it's, it's what we think of the most. Methane uh, and nitrous oxide. Those three gases are all associated with the combustion of fossil fuels. But they're also associated with uh, waste management, with industrial processes, so not just the use of, of energy fuels in industry, but also the process uh, of, of making an industrial product, as well as agriculture. And those three man-made gases are called hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs. Um, PFCs are uh, perfluorocarbons and then um, sulfur hexafluoride. Those three things are all used in electronics manufacturing, but HFCs are a, are a big gas of concern because they were, they've been used to replace ozone depleting substances in all the places where those used to exist. If you remember when, back in the day when we were getting away from CFCs and HCFCs, uh, those were replaced with HFCs, so now um, the refrigerants in your refrigerators, your air conditioning units, uh, your cars, as well as used in foams um, and aerosols. So that's where HFCs are. Uh, PFCs actually are also a byproduct of aluminum production, which we have a little bit of in the state. And then SF6 is actually used as an insulating gas in electricity transmission, which is its biggest source. So the reason why I'm going through the gases is that they, they have different sources, they affect the climate differently, and they have affected now how our accounting for gases changes under the Climate Act, and how you may also think about prioritizing maybe actions that you want to take in your own agencies. Um, so obviously carbon dioxide is the, is the reason we have climate change. There's no doubt about it. It's the highest concentration in the atmosphere by far. We've been emitting it at high volumes for a really long time. So it's had the biggest impact uh, in the last century uh, by far compared to all the rest of the gases. And the first column I have here that talks about the lifespan, so carbon dioxide is, is very long lived. Once emitted, at least some part of the carbon dioxide we emit will be in the atmosphere for a century or longer. Some of it obviously gets taken up by plants, um, but, but what goes into the atmosphere will live there for 100 years or more. But it doesn't have a big impact per ton so, or per volume. So if you are going to emit a certain amount of dark carbon dioxide, um, that, that volume has a much lower impact on climate change than the rest of these gases. But because we've been emitting so much for so long, it's had the biggest impact. Now, when you go down the list, you have the opposite thing happen. So methane and HFCs, they actually exist in the atmosphere for a very short period of time, um, less than 20 years, sometimes much, much less than that. Um, so sometimes they're referred to as short-lived climate pollutants or short-lived gases, so less than 100 years. If you could get those gases out of our annual emissions inventory and out of the atmosphere, maybe you can delay some of the worst impacts of climate change. And that's something the UN has been thinking about uh, states like, the, like New York have been thinking about how do we make sure we're also prioritizing these gases that if we address them more quickly, we can get more bang for our buck. Now the other gases, nitrous oxide also has a really long lifespan like, like CO2, and then the other fluorinated gases, PFCs and SF6, actually once they're emitted, they're essentially permanent uh, in the atmosphere. They exist for a really long time. By volume, they have the highest um, global warming potential really the highest impact per ton, but we don't emit a lot of them compared to CO2. So just generally, every gas is important. Every gas affects climate differently. One strategy that we could have is to both think about these longer-lived gases, but also prioritize the short-lived gases, because if we can get in front of those, maybe we can postpone some of the worst effects that New York might face under climate change. For example, we know CO2 is baked into the atmosphere, six feet of sea level rise for New York City, but when is that gonna happen? And maybe that's something we can address with these short-lived gases. So I mentioned that the Climate, climate Act changed the math. What happened is that the new math, when we finish our rulemaking and we put out some additional reports, is that you'll see the sources of methane and HFCs become a much bigger piece of the pie. So that means food waste, it means the use of refrigerants, 
and it means the use of things like natural gas. So let's talk about what our goals are. This is a graph showing you where we were as far as our progress towards reaching greenhouse gas goals using the old map. I, I, unfortunately, I don't yet have a full result to show you the new Climate Act kind of perspective, but this is where we were uh, before the Climate Act as far as viewing our trajectory. You have 1990 emissions, you have the 2016 emissions, and we are about 13% lower. We're supposed to be 40% lower in the next 10 years and then have an 85% reduction from 1990 by 2050. And the reason why 1990 is kind of the baseline year is that the baseline year for most countries. Um, most countries have signed the UN treaty called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to use 1990 as a baseline. The Climate Act has those two goals. It also has a goal of ultimately reaching carbon neutrality. So what I don't have on the slide are negative emissions. For example, that CO2 that's pulled out of the atmosphere from, um, from trees, for example, so forest carbon, from soils, et cetera, as well as maybe technologies we'll have in the future um, to collect emissions um, artificially. So we have the potential of negating some of our emissions by enhancing that kind of sequestration. Um, again, the change to accounting, there's going to be an emphasis on methane and HFCs. There's going to be a big role for forests and agriculture and for state land uh, to help meet this carbon neutrality goal. And the Climate Act also wants to, uh, has us include not just emissions within the state, but to account for the full life cycle of fossil fuels that are imported into the state. And that's where emissions associated, for example, with natural gas have gone up considerably because there's a lot of methane leakage in the, in the production system. Not super relevant for you guys today, but just letting you know. Did you have a question? I do have one. This? Yeah, I had one sure. quick question that came in specifically on this slide, so I wanted to just um, sneak it in here. Absolutely. Um, so what sectors do each color in those bars represent? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I think we lost the pictures at some point. <laughs> Um, they, they actually go with the, the magnet image that we made. So the bottom um, is transportation. It's the only emission source that's gone up since 1990, other than HFCs. Um, and then I believe it's buildings in orange and electricity in yellow. So electricity, we've made a lot of progress on. And that's really the transition. Again, this is the old math. This is the transition away from coal to natural gas and renewables. Um, and then the building is a lot of kind of enhanced energy efficiency. The gray is kind of the rest of it, so agriculture and waste and, and industrial processes. Thanks for pointing that out. I was thinking that I was looking at the slide. I'm like, oh, we lost our pictures. Uh, it used to be a car, a building, and a, and a light switch, I think. So thanks. Uh, one thing just to point out, uh, it's, it, it's hard sometimes you look at these and you're like, we're not making enough progress, but state staff have been working for a long time and, and a lot of really successful programs. And so I just want to, I want to do a call out to all of you and to just state staff in general. We have a lot of, of programs in the state that people are working on and they're really critically important. And I have to say this work here with EO88, EO4, EO166, and leadership by example is, is really critically important, especially for some of these new sectors like addressing food waste, addressing refrigerants. Uh, there, there really is a, a large audience and a lot of demand, for example, of use cases for, for new technologies and maybe new management. Um, so I really appreciate all the work that you're doing and just wanted to give you a shout out to a lot of the programs that you may have heard of. Okay, so let's just get into uh, you know a little bit of detail, and I'll just go through and, and give you my two cents on these, and then um, we'll take some questions. So I mentioned those all the the six greenhouse gases that we're really focused on, and really three of those are things that um, you may want to consider or that you are already considering, and maybe have some input on to share with everyone. 
Um, so for carbon dioxide and operations, we're talking about uh, the use of electricity, uh, vehicles, and potentially heating of, of space or food. For hydrofluorocarbons or those HFCs, we're talking about the use of refrigerants, so that's predominantly space cooling. Could also be food, uh, food refrigeration, but also new technologies like heat pumps are technically could be used for heating and cooling. Those also use refrigerants. And then for methane, you know, a big source is going to be the potential for food waste. Um, and I'm going to go through each of these and, and what to watch for. And I have a, an asterisk here with a link. Um, there's something called the Corporate Greenhouse Gas Standard, which is the protocol for helping organizations understand their emissions. And there's a lot of really good detail. A lot of people who put effort into that over the decades to come up with a really good um, way to view emissions and, and from a corporate perspective or from an agency perspective. And that's kind of the basis of tools, for example, that uh, the Climate Registry developed for organizations or even ICLE created for local government organizations. So um, I encourage you to look at that um, to get more information. Okay, so let's go through these. So electricity, it really, the, the emissions associated with the electricity that you're using, so we all use electricity, even if you're collected, you're connected to a solar panel, for example, you're still pulling electricity from your grid and then your, your solar panels are feeding into the grid. Um, they're really, they're really very different across the U.S. Upstate New York has the cleanest grid uh, in the U.S., or at least it did <laughs> last time I checked. Um, but overall, New York, New York statewide, the electricity is getting cleaner and cleaner every year. Um, and as I said, this is super important because electricity is going to be the fuel of the future for transportation and for, for building heating and cooling. So we need to make sure that our electricity is getting cleaner. Um, but your actual emissions are not just where you are and what, where you're getting your electricity, but how much you're using. And obviously the, the key there, which I'm sure you all are already very familiar with, is, is how efficient your energy use is, can have uh, a big impact. And particularly if you're downstate, your energy efficiency will have an even bigger impact because the grid is not quite as clean as upstate New York. I don't think that should discourage anyone from taking on uh, projects to electrify your fleet or electrify your heating because that's, that will have a big benefit in terms of greenhouse gases. But uh, energy efficiency is obviously really important. Now, what about the vehicle fleet? So the fuel type matters, definitely. Um, some fuel types are cleaner than others, but also you are all very well, well aware of how cars use different amounts of fuel, so the fuel efficiency is, is really important. So key things that you know, we look for when doing an inventory of what emissions might be associated with operations is what's the size of the vehicle, what's the age of the vehicle, and how much mile are you putting on that vehicle? Uh, and like an optimal strategy would be you'd be putting the most miles on the, on the vehicle that uses the least amount of fuel. Um, and electric and hybrid vehicles are excellent because we have such a clean grid. Um, I know there, you know, there's language maybe in the past, particularly in the news about maybe electric vehicles not being cleaner. Uh, because you're using electricity. Well, in parts of the U.S. where they're still using a lot of coal to produce their electricity, that may be the case, but that's certainly not going to be the case in New York State's grid. Electric and hybrid vehicles will always be cleaner uh, per mile than a fossil fuel fired vehicle. So good strategies could include buying electric, but also just reducing the mileage and planning for where you want to put your miles in terms of which vehicles you're using. Now, for heating, it's a lot like, like the vehicles. The emissions are directly related to what type of fuel you're using and then how efficient you are in the use of that fuel or how much fuel. Um, so some fuel types are cleaner um, in terms of carbon dioxide benefits, like natural gas being cleaner than maybe propane and kerosene, for example. You know, our HSB still has some use of other fuels uh, for backcountry, for example. 
Um, it gets a little harder when you start thinking about the full life cycle. I mentioned things are kind of changing now with this Climate Act because there are a lot of methane emissions associated with the production and the transmission of natural gas. So it makes it maybe not as, as great <laughs> uh, when you're thinking about all the gases and you're thinking about the kind of the way they're having us calculate the Climate Act. But that's something that you can consider when you're, you're thinking about your own operation. Um, so a good strategy in general is just to make everything more efficient, right? So whole building improvements that kind of make it optimize efficiency, make that building use the least amount of fuel uh, that it can, and if possible, push to cleaner fuel. And uh, there's a big push within New York State to kind of move people into a, an electrification scenario. So how can you switch from using uh, fossil fuels, for example, into using electricity for heat, for example, using heat pumps, which are highly efficient um, energy-wise and also don't have the, the disadvantages of, of fossil fuel combustion. But heat pumps are also a type of equipment that uses refrigerants. So it's kind of a good uh, segue into the next piece here, which I call cooling, but again, could include heat pumps. Um, and I mentioned comfort cooling here, but also this is the same for, for food refrigeration. Um, so not only are you using electricity to power your, your equipment, but your equipment has a refrigerant in it or a chemical that's, um, that's being used to cool or heat the air. Um, globally, refrigerants are the fastest growing source of greenhouse gases. The trend has been basically take old ozone depleting substances and replace them with new HFC based refrigerants. And the two most common refrigerants that you're probably going to run into when thinking about your own HVAC equipment, for example, would be something called R22, which was an ozone depleting substance, and R410A, which was its replacement, which has HFCs in it. They're both greenhouse gases as well. And they're 2,000 times more powerful than CO2 for the same volume. So they're pretty powerful greenhouse gases. Now, unlike combustion, you're not constantly using refrigerants and burning it off. The only way that you're going to lose refrigerant and, and put it in the atmosphere is if the equipment you have leaks. So in leakage, from what I understand, I've been working a lot with equipment manufacturers this past year because I have a kind of a related rulemaking that I'm working on. Um, if your equipment is leaking refrigerant a lot, then it's also not optimized. It's not, it's not working at its optimal performance, probably having reduced energy efficiency or increased energy use, and you can be avoiding some costs um, and energy use by having better leak management. Um, so there are lots of benefits uh, towards looking at the potential for leakage. Now, if you've got someone else that services your equipment, they should be able to tell you what your system uses, um, you, could, you should be able to work with them to establish maybe a leak management protocol. Um, and also, I think service providers, but also the equipment manufacturers can give you an idea of what newer, cleaner refrigerants are out there and may be available in uh, equipment. For example, if you're looking to replace your old R22 system or you're just in the market for new equipment, um, there's guidance out there. Brendan and I also had a webinar for the Lunchtime Learning um, sustainability series recently, uh, which I talked a little bit more about what I've been learning from OEMs um, about refrigerants, and I encourage you to watch that if you want or reach out to me anytime. Now, the last thing I'm just going to talk about is food waste, um, and I'm just going to mention this briefly. I, Brendan's unit in the Division of Materials Management really have the experts here. They've established a really excellent organics recycling program within our central office in Albany. So I, I would think that they would be a great resource. I think also Gary Feinland gave a recent Lunchtime Learning Sustainability webinar uh, about food waste as well. Um, this is a huge opportunity for organizations to reduce their emissions. Uh, and again, under the Climate Act, uh, this is one of these sources that's going to be much more obvious going down the road as a, as a priority for New York State because it is the largest source of methane. Um, if you divert food material or organic material from a landfill, you're avoiding the production of methane entirely. So it's, it's, it's a very important um, thing that, that New York State is going to be looking to uh, intensify. So um, any operation, it doesn't matter, you know, if you've got a small office, you're a big agency like ours, you can be diverting waste from landfills. There are opportunities. There are almost always local partners who can take 
your food waste and recycle it or donate it. Um, and Brendan has here a nice um, the email address for the, for the organics unit and materials management that you can reach out to for more advice and questions. And I know Brendan is himself a, a, an expert on this as well. And generally speaking, what we're talking about is the volume of waste and if there's a way to bring that volume down, that's going to a landfill. Okay, so I said we would end with like uh, with a link to some references. Um, and I should say like Brendan's been working really hard to kind of gather a lot of information for people and I'm, and I'm here to help too and put, put information that would help you uh, on the Green New York website um, and continue to build that out as we go forward. So I'm just going to end it there and, and let Brendan add to that and then I'm here to answer any questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Suzanne. That was fantastic. Um, so uh, once I go through just kind of some of the resources here that the um, Operations and Engagement Subcommittee has put together for you all, um, I want you to type any questions you have into the chat box. I've seen a couple come in, um, but any that you have, make sure that you type those in and we're going to get to those uh, in just a second here. So the first resource I want to point you to is the new Green New York website. Uh, it's been up for about two years, but we're continually adding resources to it. Uh, it has recorded webinars like this one on various topics. Uh, we have tip sheets on there, so one and two page fact sheets on various operational topics, um, such as launching a rechargeable battery program at your agency to cut down on waste. Um, funding programs, so if there's any kind of grant programs out there uh, that your agency can take advantage of, we've got information on that. And we also have program contacts as well. So that's going to be your main resource here because that's got just about everything we have for you on there. So if you're, if somebody comes to you with an issue or you see something where you think, hey, we could improve what we're doing in this area, check the Green New York website, bookmark it, and make it your first place to go. As an example, one thing I'll point out on there is we recently updated our page on conducting a waste audit. Uh, we've got pictures of how to do one. We've got a table that you can download. Um, and it's kind of a, a DIY waste audit. And in addition to having that, if you go through it, you feel comfortable doing that, um, that's great. Or if you want to contact us, we can come out to your facility uh, and help you do a waste audit and train some of your staff to do it as well. So, um, you know, on that website, we've got all those resources there. And as I mentioned, the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee here is another resource for you. Um, we're here to troubleshoot. We're here to share best practices. Anything you can think of, um, you know, uh, let us know because chances are if you've thought of something that's an issue, another agency has thought of it as well uh, and we can link you up to make sure that if somebody's already solved the problem, we're not having three different agencies, um, you know, working on the same problem at the same time. We can kind of put the brain trust together, share best practices and figure everything out. So those are going to be your two big resources there. Um, and with that, we've got our contact information here, uh, and we're going to get to questions. So the first one that I saw come in um, was on SF6. So I wanted to see, Suzanne, if you can go through and explain a little bit more on that, because that, that's one of those greenhouse gas emissions, or greenhouse gases that I don't think people have heard much about. Sure. Let me, uh, I'm just going back up to our, our list of gases there, and I'm sorry, I blew through this pretty quickly, too. Um, so it's, it's, it's funny because we, we've gone through some of the sources that may exist for SF6 and it's, it's one of these synthetic chemicals that they've used for so many different things, um, including tennis balls apparently back in the day, um, uh, medical devices, for example, that kind of do a pop of air and, and you want that, that air puff to not have any kind of negative consequences on, on human health. They're kind of, uh, a lot of these fluorinated gases were, were seen as pretty safe to use and may still be used. Uh, but for SS6, the other thing is that it's used as a, as a gas for insulating the circuit uh, when, you're, when you're stepping down power voltage. Um, and so it's used in a variety of different size equipment within the electricity transmission and distribution system in New York. Um, and we're, you know, continually working on trying to improve our estimates of, of those emissions from 1990 to now. 
And uh, it's definitely come down in usage a lot, and there are newer uh, technologies available, but they haven't been widely adopted. So as we build out the transmission system for renewable energy, this is going to be another one, another one of these opportunities to try to make advancements in technology adoption in the state that may be faster than would happen otherwise. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, that was great. And just um, one follow-up question from me here with that. So you mentioned the puff of air with um, medical devices. <laughs> when I go to the eye doctor and they hold the thing up to me and, you know, do the puff of air, which I hate, is that SF6? I don't, I don't actually know which gas that is. I, I, I'm not sure. Okay. It's a very annoying it's a good one. question. It's um, a good question. <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt at this point that that's what they're using, but that doesn't mean it's not. Uh, maybe someone else knows that that's just ambient air or if that's actually a special gas that's being used. If it is, it's probably, a, you know, something like this. So the next question here is on reliability with the electricity grid. So as the state is moving towards putting more and more electric um, demand on the grid through, um, you know, heat pumps and um, battery storage and EVs and stuff like that, um, what should agencies be considering, oh, if anything, when it comes to kind of balancing that load, should they be looking at storage projects if they're doing renewables? Um, you know, are there any kind of um, time of use technologies or anything like that that should be thought of on the agency end? Absolutely, I think it's a great opportunity, I and mean, we didn't really get into that a lot. And I don't, I don't primarily work in kind of energy system. There are a lot of staff in the state that work on kind of energy system issues, but. It's all really important, and I think being able to demonstrate, as with any of these technology you know, advancements, demonstrate um, the utility for organizations, then, then you're demonstrating it to other or to private organizations too. Um, and of course, also helping transition the state to the to new clean energy sources. But absolutely, I think there's a you know, there was a push for a long time to move towards storage as well as distributed solar, distributed wind, um, and there's still a need to do that um, to lower the, the demands on the grid and to help, as you said, balance the load. Mm -hmm. So the next one here is more of a, uh, a comment on thinking about climate and operations and kind of waste generation. So we talked a little bit about uh, food waste before. Um, but also to think about single-use plastic waste as a climate issue as well. And I just mm. want to um, say that is a fantastic comment. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at our operations and what we have control of around of us, um, you know, some of this stuff is large. You need a big capital budget. Um, you need to take, you know, maybe a year of planning and trying to make the presentation to get it. But these kind of simple things like single-use plastic reduction can make a big impact because most of the single-use plastics that we're finding uh, are based on petroleum. So, you know, you're, you're um, digging fossil fuels out of the ground, making plastic out of it, using it in that um, cleaner bottle or something else for a finite amount of time, and then a lot of it is not even getting recycled at this point with, um, you know, a lot of the what's going on in the markets, and a lot of it just ends up in the trash as well. So, um, you know, that's a very good point that anything you can do waste reduction-wise impacts climate in a positive manner. Um, but especially single-use plastics. So thank you for that Absolutely. comment. Yeah, I can just add um, to that too. I mean, I, I focus on the statewide targets and the statewide limits, and those are things that, you know, we're required to do by law. We are very much affected by the greenhouse gases that are produced everywhere else in the world too. So our sea level rise is not just our own emissions, uh, driven by our own emissions. So absolutely reducing the demand for petroleum products um, or, you know, any other source of greenhouse gases, it will only help New York State. Mm -hmm. And we got a comment here on the medical um, uses for this. For dental oh, suction, they, they use ambient air, but for dental anesthesia, they use nitrous oxide. Ah, so that's, okay. uh, that's interesting. Okay. I would not have thought about that as a, a greenhouse gas <laughs> um, when you get anesthesia at the dentist. But, yeah, it's just amazing how, you know, everything is – um, kind of intertwined in this realm. So let's take a look here. Um, the next comment we have is in regards to food waste. Um, do you have um, any tips or thoughts about what an agency can do on this front and, um, you know, any examples of 
of agencies or others that are doing good work on this. I'm going to leave that for you to answer, Brendan. <laughs> I think you have a good idea. Okay. <laughs> I thought I would throw it to you first. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, as Suzanne mentioned before, food waste is a bigger area that we're looking at because of the methane emissions. Um, one agency that I'll say is doing really well on this front is DEC. Um, they have composting at their uh, central office and I believe eight out of their nine regional offices. Um, and the OGS centralized contract for uh, waste management, um, you know, and recycling services includes lots in it by region for um, composting as well. So that's something to look at. Um, see if you can find something that works on there. Unfortunately, composting is one of those things. Um, when we talk about energy efficiency or renewables, you can usually find a savings. Composting and food waste reduction is one of those that on the back end of it, uh, you're going to find that there's an increased cost um, unless you can do it, you know, in a house in a certain way. Um, Battery Park City Authority is one that I know does in-house composting. Um, they actually got a kind of a digester unit that they have in their facilities maintenance operations and they just kind of pump the compost into there. It breaks it down um, and makes it a much more manageable size. So, you know, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can look for that industrial hauler um, through the OGS contract. Uh, you can look at some of the technologies that are out there to do it on site or if you're like a college campus, you know, there might be the opportunity to have some sort of a, you know, composting pile somewhere um, near your maintenance shed or out in the woods. Um, but there's different ways to do it, and that's, that's how some of our regional offices at DEC are doing it as well. So for that one, I would say get creative um, and see what you can do. Um, but any, any food waste you can, that you're able to divert from the landfill is going to be a huge difference because not only are you helping to keep that out of the, the landfill with the methane emissions and things like that, but also the volume of waste. So there's a lot of water weight in food waste. And so if you're trucking that, you know, wherever the nearest landfill is, there's all the greenhouse gas emissions from the diesel truck that is moving it there um, because of the, the additional weight from the food waste. So if you're able to keep it close to home and compost, it, it's, it's going to make a big difference. And it just, once again, goes to anything that we do in this realm is kind of intertwined. So if you reduce something a little bit, even if you don't think of it as a climate initiative, it is a climate initiative. So uh, the next question we have here is on telecommuting. Um, and <laughs> right now, um, <laughs> uh, there's probably a lot of reduced driving and emissions because um, New York State, as we know, is on pause. Most of us are watching this from home. Um, you know, it, the question is, do you see the potential for agencies to increase their ability to telecommute after this? And is it a, re, a useful tool to reduce emissions? Um, right up front, I will say there are a couple of us that are working on trying to create um, an estimate of the emissions reductions. Um, you know, we don't have perfect data on everything revolving the state workforce here, but we're trying to get it down to a number in the ballpark of, of what's reasonable of um, what we're having now. And we're hoping that, you know, once we can actually quantify what the savings are, um, that we'll see some of these pilot programs that were taking place at agencies. I know that uh, Department of Labor was working on one. A couple other agencies have worked on pilot programs in the past that now that we've ramped this up, uh, hopefully we can take what we learned from those on the management side um, and the employee engagement side. And now that we can hopefully somewhat quantify the environmental benefits, putting those two together, um, we'll get a whole picture of what it would look like uh, if we were able to expand telecommuting. Suzanne, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I just think if people are interested in that, uh, if you didn't see in the news uh, to look at, to maybe Google, <laughs> for the New York ISO had some reports out of, of what happened to the electricity system now that uh, with the New York on pause and you see the impact not only of just the normal things you think of like commuting emissions from commuters and things, but um, how emissions come down when we no longer have kind of peak electricity use coinciding um, all at the same time as people go to work. Um, so there are a lot of interesting impacts uh, potentially from, from moving to more telecommuting. Not that I don't miss seeing you every day, Brendan. Oh, no, say. <laughs> Zoom and WebEx are just not the same. Um, so we've got here, <laughs> I do have to read this comment, an obligatory MTA plug 
once we can start moving again and we move beyond uh, the current situation, ride mass transit and you can reduce your transportation emissions exponentially. I do like that. Um, last year, um, the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee conducted a survey of state employees to see what their commute mode share was and how they're getting to work. Um, just to get into the weeds a little bit, this is what we would call scope three emissions when we're looking at things is technically employee commuting is not part of our footprint if you think of us as, if you think of your operations as a castle, this is outside the moat, it's the people coming in and out, you don't have direct impact on that, but it does make up a very large portion potentially of your overall emissions profile depending on where your agency is located. So we see some agencies that are located you know, in Manhattan, in downtown Albany, in walkable neighborhoods where it's much easier for their employees to walk, take mass transit, bike, um, carpool, um, you know, and use these alternatives and they're going to have a much lower um, scope than other agencies if you think about parks or DEC that have some far-flung locations in rural areas where there's not as many options. So, um, you know, this is, this is one of those areas where, um, you know, if there's things you can do, uh, things you can do on it, it's good. What we did find when we did that commuting survey was that um, about 20% of state employees are taking mass transit, um, which is above the national average of five, so we're about four times better in that category. Uh, we also had decent numbers for walking and biking as well uh, in our driving alone in a solo uh, fossil fuel powered vehicle was lower than the national average, which is good. So, um, yeah, we do have some data on that front and um, you know, we're hopefully in the future going to be able to uh, lower those emissions further. So if you do have questions about things you can do with your employees on that front, um, feel free to reach out. So the next question here, um, Suzanne, do you know what the most common business model is for state agencies pursuing solar or do you have any examples of um, how agencies have done that? I don't because I, I don't uh, work, you know, directly um, in this area, more on the kind of statewide emissions, um, but I think, I mean, Brendan, we know people who may be able to help there, right? Yeah, um, so if you reach out to us, we'll be able to put you in contact with some of the folks. Um, State Parks has done quite a bit with this. They're doing a lot of it in-house. Um, there's other agencies that are doing um, solar PPAs. And the one thing I will mention is that there is uh, now an OGS centralized contract uh, there's actually three of them for solar, so this will make your life much easier if you're looking for solar. The first one um, is for community solar, so this is going to be for smaller non-demand meters. Um, it covers the entire state. You basically go on there, you say, I would like community solar. Um, you'll get bids back from a couple different providers. You choose the one that gives you the best savings, and away you go. Community solar is a model where they build a solar farm somewhere else um, in, the, in the region, and then you're purchasing the output of some of the panels or the panels directly themselves. The second option um, that OGS has a contract for is the solar PPA. Um, this is what you might hear about as a remote net metering project or a, um, you know, a lease project. Um, this is where somebody is going to build a solar farm and you are going to purchase the power from it, usually for a 20 or 30 year period. Um, so OGS has a contract for that. It also includes um, consulting services from NIPA as well if you would like that. So that way you can have the experts help you with that program and get it up and running. Um, and the last thing is there's a contract for solar equipment itself. So an agency like Parks and DEC is starting to do this as well. You can take your staff, uh, get them trained on solar installations, and then install them yourself. So we've got three different options out there. Uh, for agencies um, on OGS contracts, so you don't need to worry about the procurement. We've done the hard work for you um, and tried to demystify it because we know that's a really um, that's a really uh, tough area in some instances to get started with. So the next question is: There anything currently being done with policy around concrete alternatives? Oh, interesting. Yeah, so we have process emissions and energy emissions from the production of concrete within the state, but obviously we will bring in a lot of material from, from sources outside of the state. And so there have been discussions around if you did have alternatives, you know, how could you promote them in terms of like the embedded emissions um, for concrete? 
Um, but I, I have not worked on anything specific other than, you know, hearing about maybe new types of aggregates created out of recycled material um, that may come in the future. And then also not related to concrete, but replacing maybe um, steel construction with different types of, of wood products uh, that could come out of New York State or other states. Um, so I don't have a very helpful answer for you there, but I, I know that there's a, there's interest there and there maybe there are products out there. I just, I'm not aware of them. Yes, that's the same here. I know there's a lot of work being done in that field, but um, yeah, I'm not sure of anything specifically here. Um, that's something we can look into though. So feel free to email us and um, I'll see what I can do on my end in terms of um, you know, if there are any resources out there we can point you to, and that might even be an area where we look at our green purchasing policy in the future. Um, if these alternatives that have lower embedded carbon come on the market, um, there might be some, some areas where we could look to increase state procurement in that area. So definitely a good question. Um, so here's a question about food waste um, and breaking down with methane and CO2 um, in a landfill versus composting. So could you get into that a little bit more, Suzanne, in terms of the emissions from um, how we're reducing emissions from food waste when we're composting versus a landfill? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the overall, like, production of methane and the control of those emissions is, is just a lot harder with landfills. Um, it's just a much larger volume than it would be produced if you had diverted it. The other thing, obviously, the benefit of compost is that you're essentially recycling that material and then you're going to be able to use it again. So that would lower overall emissions as well. Um, so not a very technical response to that, but it's a good point. I mean, it's not that you're not producing emissions by composting. It's just that a, a much lower amount than the methane that's being generated when you put that large volume of organics in that kind of landfill environment and then, you know, your ability to use um, that material when you compost it. Mm -hmm. And this is another area too where I'll put a, a plug in for reduction and reuse. Um, you know, we want to think about this stuff as a hierarchy. So we talk about the end of the, is you quote unquote, the end of the pipe solutions or the end of the bin, I suppose in this instance, um, of what we do when we have this material. Um, but if we're able to implement policies that significantly lower the amount of food waste that we generate, um, whether in a cafeteria setting or somewhere else, um, by switching the way stuff is served or looking at menus or working with our vendors on this, um, you know, that's going to have a big upfront impact. And then also if there's a way to donate it to a local food bank, um, you know, or other um, organization that helps the hungry, um, you know, if we can reuse it and find a way to, um, you know, keep it in circulation, then all the, the impacts that went into making that food don't get wasted. So if you have any more questions, please type them into the chat box here. Um, I got one more here. Um, are you using this past year's Green Your Commute data to help with quantifying telecommuting? Yes, we are. Um, that's where we're finding the average commute length um, for employees throughout the state um, when they're driving alone regularly. Um, and that's how we've been able to kind of use that as a representative sample and then using that commute mode share survey to say, okay, this is how many people were normally driving on a, on a given day uh, and come up with that, that uh, rough estimate. So any other questions, please type them into the chat box. Um, in case we get any more here, um, I'm going to um, just say thank you to Suzanne once again um, for taking the time today. Um, this is her third webinar that I've uh, gotten her to do in the last month, um, but they're on really important topics and she does fantastic work. So I think it's, uh, it's great for everybody to be able to hear from her uh, and really kind of, it, hopefully it's going to help you and your operations and kind of uh, demystify some of this stuff. So Suzanne, any final thoughts? No, I just wanted to thank you and thank all of you for the work that you're doing. It's just so important and I know it's not always included when we make big announcements about climate change policy in the state, but obviously all the work on sustainability is, is a part of this, and so I really appreciate all the work that you're all doing, and I hope you're all staying safe um, and, and, and your families as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, and again, if you do have questions, reach out to us, and uh, we'll do what we can to uh, help out. Thanks a lot. Stay safe.